We love horror movies, man. Uh, yeah. Horror movies are our life. You know, there's some horror goons. Uh, I don't know, Zango the Vinci. You boy, ATX the Space Vikings. Yeah. I'm trying to figure shit out. <laughs> this changed my life forever. Yes. Good. Podcast. I'm Zaino Division. It's your boy Space Viking. And low key as me. All right, with us, we got the guys who made the movie Rust Creek from IFC Midnight. We have Stu Pollard and Harris. What's your last name, brother? McCabe. McCabe. Harris McCabe. So, uh, first things first, um, Stu, give us a little bit of uh, history about you, man. I know you produced this movie, it was fucking lit. We just got done watching it. And uh, my stomach and butthole are all in knots and shit i don't you know it was a slow burn thriller um and and uh you know you got meth labs blowing up and shit and i was like oh it's like a a story we're familiar with down here in texas but um yeah so uh talk to us man uh so you wrote this movie right Stu? Uh, I did not write it. It was uh, it was very loosely based on uh, an experience I had when I was Sawyer's age, early character. Uh, basically, something I, I did when I was young and dumb, and uh, and then I pitched it to a, a writer named Julie Lipson. And she ran with it, and obviously, the first thing she did was was uh, change the gender of the protagonist to a female. Hmm. And uh, and Julie grew up in a rural part of the country as well. Uh, grew up in, in a rural part of California. And, uh, and she kind of ran with it from there. We did, did work with a, a writer from, uh, a journalist from Kentucky and, uh, and a, a detective from uh, the Kentucky uh, Police Department who uh, was familiar with a lot of narcotics investigations. So she leaned on them for a lot of research. And uh, anyway, and Lynn Harris played a big role in developing the script after Julie finished her, her drafts. And it, it literally was in development for about six years before we hired Jen to direct it. Nice. Right on. So Harris, you you are uh, you wrote part of the screenplay. Uh, I more uh, worked with Julie to develop it. So um, hmm. you know, there's there's definitely parts of I think parts of a little of all of us in it. But um, she did the bulk of the writing, and uh, and we sort of worked with her um, as uh, as the development uh, arm of of our production company. I work with all of our writers to sort of push the scripts along and get them where they can be made. So I did that with Julie for a few years um, while we were getting this getting this going. Um, on, on set, I did some of the rewrites when we were on set because Julie was, couldn't be on set with us the whole time. So every time there was like an emergency, some actor needed a line of dialogue, I would step in. <laughs> nice, man. It was... it's, it's crazy, man, because I was just telling AT when the movie ended I was like, man, you'd be surprised how often this is real in police departments in small towns in America. Like, and I just got done saying that, and it turns out to be based on kind of a true experience, man. It's kind of wild how these uh, these strange little, uh, you know, how the how these little fuck ups in, in in middle America get covered over, and we never hear about them. And how often it happens in these small towns, man. I think it's really cool that you bring these things to light, you know, because a lot of people don't realize that this shit's happening one town over or really in the town right that, that they're living in, you know? Well, certainly it, the, the story itself is, is complete fiction, but uh, the, you know, one of the things, and I've actually seen this gentleman over the last couple of weekends, cause I, or the last couple of days rather, because I'm in Kentucky, but. You know, one of the reasons the movie is rated R is uh, due to the exceptional realism in the uh, mm. in the meth making uh, aspects. And we worked with someone else from the from the sheriff's department uh, who was um, again had a this was a different individual, not the guy who helped us in the script development phase, but the guy who uh, this is a, an active member of the sheriff's department in Kentucky who helped us with, helped our production design department and our prop makers with the, the meth lab creation. And uh, he was all too familiar with how these labs work. And uh, he actually trains his detectives on 
how these labs work and how to spot them and, and it was very helpful in helping our our prop master uh put together a you know a, a, a set that it looked realistic so much so that it helped us be rated r yeah, yeah our, but, our crew had a crew had a cooking class <laughs> oh shit <laughs> Yeah, cause we was one in there. We was like, man, they went to full detail with it, and we thought that was we was like, oh, okay, that's that's pretty interesting. Yeah. So, Stu, that so you said that was based on something that happened in your life. Yeah, it, basically, uh, not so much the specific detail. I mean, parts of the of the that remained in the in the very beginning of the movie is it did involve a road trip and it did involve Kentucky and D.C. But it, it really is about. A, a impulsive decision that a young person makes. In my case, I, I just jumped in my car and started driving. Didn't tell anybody that I was leaving and didn't tell anybody where I was uh, to expect me. And two hours into my trip, I left at midnight. I got stuck in a blinding snowstorm in the middle of nowhere. And so I had about four hours to, to realize how stupid that decision was and was pretty convinced for the majority of that four hours that my goose was cooked. And uh, <clears throat> so I went from being the uh, the bulletproof 22 year old to to being somebody who was fearing for his own life and i uh, didn't really have any options and you know no cell phone back in that in that day and age uh hmm. no gps nothing like that and so that was that was sort of the feeling that i thought might be a, make a good premise uh for a film someday and that was the idea that i pitched julie this feeling that, that that sort of every young person goes through at some point where they realize they're not invincible hmm. and uh, and that was the idea that Julie ran with and, and created Sawyer from. Was and, that, and that's why you, the movie starts with this road trip that we reverse the geography to. She starts in Kentucky and is on her way to D.C. and and, and makes a somewhat impulsive decision. She's got slightly different motivations, but in this case, doesn't tell anybody uh, what she's up to out of pride because uh, uh, she she didn't want to be embarrassed if she didn't get the job and uh, uh, and all that. But. Um, but the bottom line is she never thinks about the fact that by covering her tracks, nobody knows where the hell she is. Yeah. And so it takes a few days before anybody realizes she's missing. And as a result, uh, she's, she's wildly off course and nobody realizes it until it, 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 in her case, it could be way too late. I think Julie totally killed it with the, with the story though, man, because how many, you know, so we're, we're down here in Houston, right? And it's, it's fucking huge. And I can't tell you how many fucking times the GPS take me to the wrong fucking place and and that feeling of like damn it i'm late i gotta go here and then you know and so it's like that's something that could totally really happen you know what i mean like you could you felt for for sawyer and uh and sawyer was a little beast though yeah, man she, it was a badass. yeah sawyer was a badass yeah well i think i, I think if uh <clears throat> if the movie has any kind of uh, uh, a real positive impact on uh, young women. I happen to have a daughter about Sawyer's age, and, mm. and one thing her contemporaries have taken away from the film is that uh, they've all been inspired to take self-defense classes. Nice. So, um, so Sawyer's certainly somebody that knows how to how to carry herself. So, uh, <clears throat> and you also know that Harris is from Texas as well. He's, he spent a, a, a good amount of time in San Antonio, if I'm correct, correct right, Harris? Yeah, yeah. When I was when I was a kid, I'm, I'm more from Connecticut now. That's where I went to high school. But yeah, we, we moved all over. My brother was born in Dallas, and we lived in Dallas and San Antonio. So I'm a big Spurs fan. Oh, go Rockets! Go Rockets! <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's what's up. So if you, uh, want, if, if you want to devote this this podcast to NBA basketball, you've got the right guy. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> that's pretty cool. I was um. I was tripping by like I like the characters too, man, of, of Buck and Hollister, man, how they um how they really kind of played off each other. It's cause it's always that one brother that's kind of ruling and you look at the you look at uh Buck like man, you could really whoop Hollister ass, but <laughs> the way they yeah. played the way they played off each other was like perfect. It's like, okay, you see who runs the pack, you see who runs it. And it was a good twist because I was not expecting until so they start going into the rural areas, and then we kind of like, man, you know what? It might be some drugs involved. <laughs> yeah. So oh, they yeah. deep in these woods, and we like, only things in the woods is cooking this meth. <laughs> it was like, so it was a yeah. perfect, perfect plot, man. And, I, and I, we we really was digging that. And I like how the characters played off each other so well. And well, they got Daniel, their ass whooped. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Daniel, who plays uh, Buck, was 
was actually we hired him because he was a local guy. It was in the script. It was actually a, a slightly smaller part. Mm. Um, and he was a local guy, a local actor who had just moved out to L.A. And since then, his career has been doing really well. And he's gotten a lot of gigs. But he sort of was just taking the lead, moving to L.A. from Kentucky. But he could work as a local. So we brought him on. And his chemistry with, with Hollister was so good that our director, Jen, pulled, pulled me aside at one point and was like, hey, can we give him some, some of Hollister's lines? Can we figure out a way to make his part a little bigger? Because the two of them played off each other so well. So yeah. they did a little, a little improv and they got a little more, more lines and sort of fleshed out those characters in a way that it, maybe it wasn't on the page as, mm. as good as they, they brought it out. Oh, yeah. Was the whole thing shot in Kentucky? Yeah, 100%. And Daniel's a, a really interesting guy, too, because he's, he's uh, you'll see when we release the extras for the film in a couple of months when we uh, we release the cell through version in the Blu-ray. Um, Daniel, and again, I give, I give him a lot of credit and Jen a lot of credit, that, that role on the page could have just been, you know, kind of the thug or the muscle in the film, and he... He absolutely approached it from almost a Shakespearean actor's perspective and is so thoughtful. And this is a guy who, who's who been a, a football player and a mm. rapper and a, mm. and a Shakespearean trained actor and a theater director. And uh, and now is, he's, he's going to be in a movie with Mark Ruffalo in a couple of weeks. So he's a, uh, he, he's a, he's a, we just did a bourbon tasting yesterday and in Louisville, he's a he's a sweetheart of a guy, a gentle giant if ever there was one, and a, a really really great guy. And, and he and Sean O'Brien are both are both from Kentucky. And to answer your question, yes, we shot the film I- entirely in uh, uh, in Kentucky, nice. mostly mostly within a, a day's drive, or I should say, a, an hour's drive of Louisville. Uh, about about three or four days actually in Louisville, where I'm from and where I'm I'm, I'm at right now. Um, but uh, but nothing really in the city this time around. We we're all obviously in the country for this one. How long did it take to shoot the whole movie? Uh, I think uh, literal production days. You, you'd have to correct me if I'm wrong on this, Harris. I want to say it was it was probably about 25 days. Hmm. Uh, the uh, I don't have it written down in front of me, but it was originally going to be about 20 days. Uh, I think total, and we we had some weather issues. When we when we first got into our schedule, and so that got truncated down to maybe 18 at the end of 2016, and then we came back and did maybe seven or eight in uh, the beginning of 2017, which really ended up benefiting the film in the long run. So that that works out to if my 18 plus seven math is correct, that be that be 25 days spread out over uh, the end of 2016 and the beginning of 2017. Yeah, there were some beautiful shots, um, like especially like in the beginning. Did y'all shoot that with like a drone or? Yeah, we had a um, we had a great drone crew, a local drone crew that was there um, that shot all our, uh, a lot of our travel stuff. Um, that was a, that was a fun treat for me. I got to do the, to direct a lot of the drone stuff. Um, so we went out there with the, the cars on a lot of highways and just beautiful. Floor. I mean, you can't. That's the thing about shooting in Kentucky is you can't buy or, or recreate gorgeous scenery like that mm. and um and for better or for worse it hurt us schedule wise and, and probably hurt us a little budget wise but um for better or for worse you can't really fake that that cold either it was it was really very cold and very um it was a, it was tough living conditions out there shooting outside as often as we were in, in single digit temperatures most of the time our our whole actors and crew were troopers to, to stick through it yeah they uh no yeah there some of those uh those shots were gorgeous and i had uh Another another little question that just came into my head. So we haven't talked about old Lowell yet. So yeah, Lowell, you know, everybody's neighborhood, shady meth meth cook. Um, so we'll enter Lowell. So that was funny how she comes in with, I loved the whole thing with him. Like, you don't know if you can trust him yet or not. And to me, it was like the first time I really kind of trusted him was when he knew she stole that little uh, tool off his desk and he didn't. He didn't f- fuck with her about it. You know what I mean? Uh-huh. Um, so who was the actor that played Lowell? Uh, that's an actor. Uh, that's okay. Go okay, 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 okay. And um, is he, where did y'all find him at? Did he, is he like a, another guy that's from Kentucky or he was pretty good? No, there's a, he was great in the movie. Um, uh, another kind of 
his local connection, but a different kind. Um, <clears throat> he's L.A. based and has been acting for years. Uh, he's, he's probably best known for a role he had on Mad Men. But, uh, and he's got a couple of really cool roles coming up. But, uh, but he's actually our director's next-door neighbor. Wow. No shit. <laughs> so, so, uh, awesome. He, aud- he auditioned just like everybody else, but he, uh, he found out about it because uh, Jen gave him the high sign. Uh, basically just said I'm, I'm doing something new you should come in and read for it so and, and he in the script it's interesting uh, in the script Lowell was written as sort of a, probably a, a slightly younger guy and definitely a bigger kind of more intimidating uh, more physically imposing presence that sort of didn't say a lot but you know was a you know kind of a scary dude and it, it was weird we had we had read some guys that sort of fit that profile and, and they were they were fine but nobody was really lighting the world on fire for us and then we saw Jay's audition, and it wasn't what anyone had expected based on the script. Mm. But we just sort of knew there was something there. There was some spark there. And everyone was like, yeah, I think, I think I'll think i reimagine how, what I, how I was conceiving <laughs> this character because he could do it. Pretty awesome. Yeah, it was, it was one of the, the favorite parts of the, of the casting process, which is, which is different for me because this is the, the first film that, that I've, I've produced with a, a director for hire, as it were, so... Jen was off, you know, auditioning with the actors while we were trying to sort of prep other aspects of the movie, and she would send us the selects of, of the casting sessions and really not tell us who her favorites were. She would obviously send us the, she wouldn't send us people she didn't like. But she'd be like, "Here are the, here are the favorites that I have for these roles," and uh, but they wouldn't be in any particular order, and we would just, you know, sort of rank them on the whiteboard after we watched them, <clears throat> and um, and. Literally, all our choices sunk up in perfect order. So uh, when we told her we really liked Jay, she was like, oh my gosh, that's who I really like too. And same thing with Hermione and, uh, and several of the other actors. So you know, it was really, really great to, uh, to see Jay's audition pop off uh, the screen like that. Uh, he was, it turned out to be a, the perfect choice for the film. Um, one thing I'm really interested in when I'm talking to guys like, like you two is... Um, and I think I think listeners of this podcast, I think that's what attracts them to this podcast is um, people like you, guys that are that are creators, guys that uh, basically get shit done. You know what I'm saying? They they make an idea into a thing. Um, so I think you would. I I kind of have to ask the question for the listeners is. Uh, what is your backgrounds and, and where did you come from? Where did you get started? And and what what would you say? What was before this, and what do you think is next? You know what I'm saying? Is this your first go around with something big uh, like this, where you have a director for hire and you know you're having big auditions? Um, and where do you see yourself going from this? You know. Sure, and you're you're welcome to ask questions about how we finance the thing too, if if that helps your audience. Oh, it's we coming. We can't get into we can't <laughs> get into specifics about. Uh, okay, we can't get into specifics about exactly how much it costs, but um, but happy to. to of course, it was a method. Provide whatever insights huh. we can to help your listeners. Um, <clears throat> but uh, but in terms of where we come from, that's you know Harris and I come at it from very divergent paths. So I don't know if you want to hear his. His story first, or, or mine. His might be a little shorter. We flipped the coin. Uh, Harris, you won. You go first. <laughs> All right. <laughs> yeah, um, you know, I've always been a big movie fan and a big movie buff, and um, always thought that was interesting. But growing up, you know, where I did in, in Texas and then in Connecticut, I didn't know anybody who was in the movie business, and that just seemed it seemed like an impossible thing to do. Yeah. Um, it just didn't seem like a job that normal people had. I couldn't I couldn't name a single person who did it. So I never thought of it as an option. And I found myself, um, you know, going bouncing between the bar and, and, and a bunch of college programs that I didn't really wasn't getting a lot out of, and ended up with uh, around age thirty with two bachelor's degrees in English and political science. And that was around two thousand eight when there was no jobs anymore. And for the first time in my life, I couldn't get a job. And was um, I was doing construction and uh, doing like sheet rocking and carpentry and, and I was repairing sails for sailboats. I don't even sail, just anything to get work. Um, <laughs> All of these and, skills came in handy on the movie, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they did actually. But on a whim, I just applied to USC. Um, you know, I thought, hey, you know, uh, why not just give this film school thing a shot and see if that gets me anywhere. Not that you need film school, but I needed something to get out of my rut. So 
I applied to USC. It's one of the toughest film school programs in the country to get into, and somehow I got in, and um, and that you know sent me out to LA. And, and then once you get out, once you get out to LA, all of a sudden being in movies, like everyone here works in the movies, and it's not even a big deal. So I now I sort of that would be my advice to anybody out there thinking about getting into it is know that it's not. It's not some weird thing that only special people can do. Anybody who's creative can get involved. You just got to start doing it. Yeah. Um, so for me, going to school was a big part of that. And, and you know, Stu was one of my professors at USC and hired me right out of school nice. to help with de- development with him. So this is basically my first, you know, we've, I've been with the company uh, for what, like three, four years now. Um, and I, yeah. I love what I'm. I love what I'm doing. I love development. I love working with writers. I'm a writer and director myself. Um, so I would like to, you know, I would like to do a little more writing and directing, but I'm enjoying my role as sort of a producer um, and a development exec, uh, as it were, um, right now. Good that's, shit, that's, man. That's dope, man. So we're actually watching, we're actually, we're watching the dream come true, man. It's pretty yeah. fucking dope. Pretty yeah, awesome. yep. Yeah. It's the Dude. first job I've ever had that I actually like more than not working. You know? <laughs> Boy, do I understand that shit, man. Yep, yep. Stu, what's up with you? Well, first off, disclaimer, Harris is just saying these things because I, I gave him a, a, a week off with pay. Uh, uh, hey! <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, Harris has got me on the on the uh, chronology calendar by about 10 years because I'm in my, my, uh, my early 50s. But uh, long story for me is is I did the, the, uh, the film school route thing as well, but I did it, you know, more than 20 years ago. So <clears throat> that's how I got out of the corporate world and into it. Um, but that's neat, that, that need not be the path, the path that everybody take. And the, you know, the risk in the film school model these days is it can get you into a big pile of debt if you're not careful. So, you know, everybody needs to make their own choice as to how they get into the business. And as Harris said, it can be, it can be a great way for some people, but there's lots of ways to get in. And there's certainly lots of people who worked on this movie and others. Uh, uh, who, who didn't take that route. So if, uh, if that route seems too daunting, don't get discouraged. Um, but I, I went that way and I got very stubborn once I got out and decided I wanted to, uh, to start making things right away. And I was very fortunate in that, that I had a few people who I knew had deep pockets. And, uh, and so I just started raising money to go make something and was, was fortunate enough to get something financed and made right out of the gate. Uh, and that was in 1998. And that was a film called Nice Guys Sleep Alone. And I was able to film that movie to uh, a place you've heard of called HBO and then a place that not many people have heard of in 1999 called Netflix. Hey. Um, and uh, anyway, didn't quite make my money back on that one, but that led to another one. And uh, that was called Keep Your Distance in 2005. And that movie didn't do too well. And, and frankly, that that caused me to get a little beat up on the whole process and led me to teach. But after several years of doing that and producing for other people, uh, that led me to get back into the, into the game. And it was via teaching and meeting people like Harris and several other people who work for our company, which is called Lunacy, uh, that led, uh, led to literally Russ Creek. Uh, and I include Julie in that equation too, meeting young writers and, uh, and people, uh, who, I mean, I take a tremendous sense of, of, uh, of pride in that, you know, on Friday when our film went national on iTunes and Amazon and opened in New York and it opens uh, on, on the 11th and a bunch of other cities that it's the first produced credit for Julie and for Harris and for a bunch of other people on our team. And um, it's not exactly old hat for me. That part of it never gets old. But the fact that, that a lot of people had faith in me and, and worked with me and now they've got uh, a movie that's getting well received and, and it has the opportunity to be watched by an awful lot of people is uh, um, a good feeling because uh, as, as Harris now knows, it's, it's just it's a bear to get these things off the ground. Um, and uh, anyway, so that's kind of how I got to where I am in, a, in a, as short a way as I can put it. It's got to feel good to, to know <laughs> that after, you know, fucking around with, you know, after going at it and going to film, you know, like you're living the life you did and the story you have. It's got to feel good to come out with a badass movie, though. You know what I mean? Like, it's a dope movie, man. Yeah, it really is. It truly is. Well, I, I appreciate that. A lot of people contributed to it, and we got we got very fortunate with our director. To this day, I mean, Jen McGowan was sending me texts less than an hour ago telling us our, 
our online platform that is run by our distributor that tells people where they can buy tickets was down. And I don't know how long it was down for, but it was not down for very long because, you know, she alerted the distributor that it wasn't working. So she, she works as hard as anybody I've ever met in this business. And, uh, and it's not over yet. Mm. Not, not for her, not for us, um, but, but she's, um, she pushes us all to be better. And, and, uh, it doesn't, it doesn't mean that it doesn't make uh, our lives more challenging because it's, uh, it's somebody who pushes us all to be better. But I would, I would, I would work with her again in a heartbeat because I'd rather have somebody like that on my team than somebody who doesn't care. Yeah. And, uh, and so, uh, when you put her in charge of, she's the CEO, CEO of the movie. So, uh, I couldn't think of a better choice. Did she write that line? Did she write that line when, uh, Lowell was talking to Sawyer, he said, you know, when the, the sheriff, uh, he was talking about the sheriff, and he said, uh, man, he's the worst kind of snake you can get. And she said, why? And he goes, because he doesn't rattle before he bites. Did she write that? Because that was fucking fire. Uh, it, it, that's either Julie or McCabe. I, I, I would have to credit that. That sounds like a McCabe line, but I don't know. <laughs> that shit was, we were all like, ooh. <laughs> Yeah, that does sound like one of mine, but it's that's the funny thing about uh, when you sort of do this thing where multiple people sort of have a hand in, in writing some of the script. And, and I, do I say this acknowledging that 85, 90% of the script is Julie. Um, but every once in a while, I'll see a line and I'll be like, ooh, that was really smart. I wonder where Julie came up with that. And I'll realize, realize it was one of mine. Or I'll see a line <laughs> that I think is one of mine, and then I'll look it back and I'll realize it's whatever. So it's hard to tell after a while. But <laughs> that, was, that, was a, that was a dope line. We were... <laughs> That was pretty cool. So was the movie sold before you make it, or do you make it, shop it, bring it to all these film festivals, and someone buy, someone like IFC comes around and buys it? Yeah, well, the, the the classic definition of independent film is that you make the movie speculatively, so mm-hmm. which is is the highest risk game there is uh, in film, and <clears throat> which is is. Why, in some ways, they say the, the money that finances these things is dumb money because it's so tough to make your money back. But uh, but you described it exactly at the end. There it means it means uh, you've got to cobble the money together, go out and make the film with no advance guarantee of uh, mm. a distribution, and then get people interested in it and, and sell it. So that's why uh, we we make it with uh, with lesser known actors and a, and a much more limited budget. Uh, because the more traditional way to finance it would be to make it with financing where all the uh, pre-baked formulas and built-in distribution make sense. But, but what triggers all that uh, that calculus to work is uh, is in most cases name actors uh, or or a director with a much bigger track record. Like mm. when we when we were working out all the negotiations with with Jen to direct this, her manager at the time was was petrified we would, pull, we would pull her off it and i'm like i'm not going to pull her off and i hired to direct it and they're yeah. like well we're not we're not fully greenlit yet and we're not signed yet and i'm like well, i'm not going to back off on this and it's like well you know they, they just didn't want to be in a position where um, you know we we somehow came into more financing and changed our minds and i i don't operate that way once i commit to somebody i, I still committed to them but uh, uh, but, but movies fall apart all the time when they're, they're based on these larger formulas where the only way the money gets secured in the, you know, 10, 20, 50, hundred million dollar level, which this is obviously light years from that, uh, is because this piece triggers this piece plus this piece plus this piece triggers all this money, uh, plus all this debt. Uh, mm-hmm. and that's how they get it made. The, the whole, the whole movie, like in its, in itself was, was a, was it, it was put together very well. We we always be real critics of like a movie with non like non known actors. Like okay, how's it gonna turn out? Like you say from the beginning, man. We we viewed all that. We was like, oh, that's a drone shot. Beautiful scenery, beautiful concepts. You know, well put together. It was like it because we got this rating we do. Like if if we watching a movie and we start texting on our phone, the movie <laughs> lost us, man. It's no yeah. more. It's no more of a movie to us because we like. It's no way I'm supposed to be watching something. Yeah. When and then I'm texting. It's, I, I lost all control, we, but we, it, it hit us right off the bat. And we we call like, it okay. the keep us off our phone factor. Yes. Here it guts. Yeah. If you can keep us off our phone with this yeah. ADHD going on, 
You're basically talking to Buck and Hollister right now. Yeah, no shit. <laughs> and, and, you know. And, and, and it got us because we was like, okay, okay. And we, because we, we saw the, we saw the trailer and we was like, shit, it's a good movie. We was like, well, damn. We got it. We let's let's check it out. So when we checked it out, I was like, "Oh shit, this is like attention, like is is getting there." And I love that, man. I love that about movies. Yeah. Well, we got. Um, we were fortunate too, as Stu said. We had a great crew, not just Jen, but I mean, we had a uh, a great crew that was working for you know. At some points, a lot of them were working for less than what they normally would because they believed in the project. So we had a we have an incredible DP, Michelle Lawler, that made it look beautiful. That that's you know one of the big things about these things with when you see there's no name actors in it, you expect it to look like shit too. Yeah. And it's great that we had a, a, a great camera crew and a great uh, camera equipment, and we had uh, some great. Uh, uh, color grading after the fact at Company Three, and our, our composer is, you know, going to be probably possibly nominated for some awards this year for another project that he did this year. But he did he's a great up, job he's up for a Golden Globe tonight. Hey. Yeah, he's up for a Golden Globe tonight for for a different project. So I mean, he, and he knocked it out of the park. I love the score for this thing. And uh, our uh, we had a great uh, effects team that helped us blow stuff up uh, right <laughs> from from your neck of the woods, right from Texas. That oh, yeah. Cool. Drove up and helped us explode some stuff. Yo, so um, many Sam. Can't, yeah, you can't you can't get that. You know, it's tough to do that at a budget level where we're at to get that quality of, of people. But when they believe in the project and and they feel strongly about it, you get you know you get some great people there that make it look a lot more a lot more valuable and a lot more polished than it would. Yeah, I uh, so I, I really liked it because I thought you know like a lot of times when you have you know it's like um, a woman protagonist that fights to get out of like an impossible situation you know like a lot of times it's not believable because all of a sudden she, all of a sudden she knows like she's a black belt in jujitsu and she's like you know all of a sudden she has all these skills like she can she's like a ninja samurai and she can kill everyone at once yeah. but this was like really believable you know like like other the situations she got in like you know, you could totally see it happening. She had to kick and scrap, and she she was she was a good athlete. Yeah. So she burnt off, and she got away. You know, like I thought it was the whole. I mean, good job, guys, on the movie. It, yeah, it was dope. Um, to keep yeah. us, to keep our, you know, attention deficit hyperactive asses, you know, entertained. Uh, that's a that should get an award in itself. Yeah. Um, so what's the what's are y'all gonna do another movie or? Because I'm kind of I'm kind of like. Yo, y'all should do another one. <laughs> well, we we appreciate that, and, and uh, every every little bit of support helps. We we are particularly excited about uh, another script that we actually have from the same writer, uh, mm. Julie Lipstead, and that's a, a another thriller. Um, Harris can actually tell you a, a lot about that because he's been uh, similar to, to uh, Rush Creek, been intimately involved with the development of that project. Uh, yeah, that one's called The Man Who Knew Bell Star, and it's based on a, a, a pretty well-known short story by a guy named Richard Bausch, who, um, it's, it basically, we like to say it's like Paper Moon meets The Professional. Um, this ex-con gets out of prison, picks up a teenage girl hitchhiking, and basically it, shit goes haywire after that, and they end up sort of in this cat-and-mouse cross-country road trip full hey, of murder. Yeah. Um, so that's a really excellent script, um, and we're trying to get uh, get that one organized to get that together because we think that one's really strong and, and is going to have you know a lot of the same appeal that Russ Creek did, where it's a thriller, but it's a thriller that zigs when you think it's going to zag and doesn't always play by the normal rules. You know, doesn't always do exactly what you expect. Oh, that's that's awesome, guys. We we really really looking at sites. I think we well, I know we're we following like all your sites, so we're trying to. Figure out how do people follow y'all? What's y'all uh, Instagram, Facebook, anything that they can look you up on? Yeah, uh, our production company handle is at Lunacy Prods. Uh, so that's that's just short for production. So L U N A C Y P R O D S. And then for Russ Creek, it's at Russ Creek across the board for Twitter, Instagram, Facebook. And then. Uh, uh, me personally, same thing. That's Stu Pollard, and then Harris. I'm not sure what you are. Um, I'm not sure either because I'm really not too active <laughs> on social media. <laughs> I'm, I'm, so I'm one of the. You'll be able to find Harris intuitively via uh, those three places. Gotcha, gotcha. Right. I feel <laughs> you, Jay. You're an off the grid type of guy. <laughs> yeah. If you're, if you're ever looking for some 
some guys over six foot that's mutes, let us know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you're ever looking right, for yeah. for two big ass wrestler looking dudes to sit in a corner and eat a sandwich, where are your fucking guys? Uh, where, where are y'all? Where are y'all? Where are y'all based now? Y'all based in um, in California? Or? Uh, we have an office in in LA and West LA. Okay. And, uh, and in Louisville. Nice. I think we come. We actually coming out there for the fright uh, in the in Halloween. Actually, we're gonna be out there. Yeah, the Halloween Horror Nights. Halloween Horror Nights at Universe Studios. Oh, cool. Yeah, definitely right. be out you there. Hit with. us up. We'll have to grab a drink. Yeah, yeah definitely. That's what we're talking about, baby. Yeah, yeah we got that bourbon. <laughs> we'll see if we we'll see if we can't introduce you to uh, a couple of the actors. Hey, hey. that'd be awesome, man. Oh yeah, if we can meet um, Hermione or. <laughs> yeah, you know, she's English and she's based in the UK. She's uh, she's a tougher introduction just because of geography, but uh, she was uh, she's amazing to work with. And if we can figure out how to do that, we will certainly try. <laughs> That's what's up, y'all man. are the shit, man. Yeah, appreciate Thank you so man. much for uh, for coming on our little podcast and and uh. Thank you for, you know, taking the time out to talk about your movie. Yeah. And thank you for putting out a good movie, man. Yeah, the good work, man. Introducing us to Russ Creek is was a beautiful man. Well, appreciate it. And uh, certainly uh, wherever you, you post this, let us know. And uh, folks can figure out where to watch us at uh, RussCreek.com. Just hit the watch tab and that'll, that'll uh, Definitely. Uh, send them where to watch. And we appreciate the support and uh, hope to talk to you again real soon. Real soon. All right, bro. All right Stu. Thanks, All right, guys. All right, Harrison. Thanks, guys. Take care, guys. See ya. Happy New Year. Bye bye. Bye. Hey. Hey. Some good shit. You want to keep going? Yeah. 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 So, should we do the intro? No. Yeah, we'll do it after. Yeah. I mean, we could do it right here. Well, we can. So there it is, motherfuckers. There it is. There it is, you fucking sluts. Episode seven, man, and it's it was went down in the splash, just like this grape monster. Yeah. I say it again, grape. Ultraviolet monster. Yeah, I know you hear that shit. I think, monster. <laughs> I think the coolest thing with those two guys is you get to watch the progress yeah. of a film career. You know what I'm yeah, saying? With, definitely. With with uh, Harris, who's coming up in the thing, who is actually yeah. a student of Joel's. Yeah, that's perfect. And then like him getting his first big jobs and shit like that. And then Joel, who's been, you know... Stu. Uh, Stu. Yeah. Same or shit. Or Joel. Or, I mean... People that know him call him Joel. <laughs> Y'all don't yeah. know that, but I yeah. mean, if you really know him, you call him Joel. Fucking Joel. Yes. Anyway, so, but you get to watch the progress happen to where Stu is actually his uh, his teacher and, you know, from the, the producer of the film to a guy that's just making shit happen on the other end of the film, you know, it's pretty cool to watch the whole progress within those two, you know, the whole... Uh, and it, I think even when they're talking about things and they're talking about the movie, they still carry that, you know, that uh, that big brother, little brother type of uh, camaraderie that they have with each other. It's pretty cool how they bounce shit off of each other. Yeah, they were cool, man. They were they were dope as shit. The uh, so should I do like the the guts recap of the of the movie? Oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and definitely. Do it. The, um... All right. Like it was Russ so, Creek was the shit. Yeah, yeah it was Russ, Russ Creek. Creek, and you know it's not like a horror. It's more of a thriller than a yeah. horror. But you know, and it guts, man. We'll get we'll fuck with anything. Yeah, that's dope. It's, it's it's good shit, man. Yeah, because it, it, the the fact it was an independent movie, man. Yeah. And we and like we like we were saying in the interview, we you know you go into independent movies with non like non big actors and all that. You're yeah. expecting it to be like oh this might be it might be crap. Late. it might crap. You know it was a slow burner, man. And it was like shit, man, because it started off how they filmed it, the shots they had. They didn't try to put too much into it, and they didn't try to overdo it. Yeah, they didn't try to overdo it because it was like damn, okay, we in one location. It wasn't like oh we over here, then we over here, then we over there, and the characters that. Like we like we big on like the feelings part of a movie. The characters that kind of start feeling for each other didn't fall in love. Yeah, it was more of a trust factor. Yeah, like I'm not supposed to be with this guy how that's kidnapping that got not kidnapping me but has me in his trailer. Other than I wake up and he's not a bad guy, and it kind of dictates to where it's like I'm not saying sell drugs, kids, or do anything like that, but 
Yeah, not all drug dealers are fucking out here trying to kill people. You know what I'm saying? But they drugs are. So kids be aware of meth labs in the woods. <laughs> yeah. The uh, so Rush Creek starts hot chick. Uh, Sawyer, played by athlete uh, chick Hermione. Uh, what was her last name? From England, She's from UK. Yeah, yeah, that was her last name. Was from England. Uh-huh. Hermione from England. UK. So she <laughs> she was fine. But so Hermione, she's like a little athlete chick. You see her like pumping up on the track. You know, she's like, it's a brand new day. She's she's feeling good. She just got a job interview in Washington, D.C., and she's got to drive. From Kentucky or through Kentucky, some shit like that. Uh, so she's got to go through the wilderness to get on this interview. Well, of course, the fucking GPS fucks her up because there's a traffic traffic jam. So she's trying to follow the GPS through the backwoods. Well, she goes through and it takes her to uh, a road that's been discontinued, yeah. a road blocked off. Everybody GPS does that nowadays. Fuck yeah. Uh, yeah. Can we get someone on that, please? Because oh, sure. the GPS... Shit, man. I like, do your job. You got one job, GPS. Yeah, yeah, and Siri. Siri. Telling me my location. I don't know Dumb they bitch. Are. But anywho, so she gets lost basically in the wilderness. She pulls up trying to turn around and get, she finds a road map. And she remembers she had an old road map in her car, like a an old school version yeah. that's, you know, paper form. She had your granddaddy road map. She in had her, your grandpa's road map. She pulls it out. And then, so meanwhile, these, these, uh, Buck and Hollister, these two goons from Kentucky, are in the corner doing some shady shit with meth, and they're like, "Shit, does she see us?" They think she sees us, so they pull up on her while she's got the hood out, and basically, you don't know what's going on. The tension is high. What do they want? Are they gonna let her go? They don't know. Well, they try to fucking get her. She all of a sudden starts fighting like a motherfucker. You know, she she ain't stupid. The character Sawyer is smart. She's boom hits a boy in the nuts. Boom starts running away. They they the uh, and it, it cluster fucks because they're not prepared for her to fight. So they kind of, they kind of catch her. She they she catches them off guard. They stab her in the leg and she kicks them. Uh, the old the fat guy in the face and then uh and then um so she runs she runs. Like, she gets away through the, the wilderness because she's an athlete. She runs through the creek and then kind of, like, hides under some rocks and throws their scent off by throwing a rock down the road and throws their scent off. And, and so, basically, she gets away and kind of so, uh, passes out because she loses blood. Well, a motherfucker... Loses blood? Yeah, she got yeah. stabbed in the leg. Oh. Stabbed in the leg. So, so motherfucker... Uh, so, and then this guy, Lowell, comes in. And Lowell, you don't really see him, but all of a sudden she wakes up. Her leg's been kind of like gauzed up and bandaged. She's like, where the fuck am I? She's in a bed, she's in a trailer. She's delusional. She don't know what's going on. And she's high of meth fumes. Well, <laughs> this she's in a fucking meth lab. And this guy... Like you do. Like you, you know, wake up in a meth lab from time to time. <laughs> Shout out 1997. Yeah. And then, so she wakes up in a meth lab, this guy Lowell, and you don't know... Who Lowell is, like yeah. he's kind of shady. That's where I'm getting Lowell from. That's that, where I'm getting Joel from. Joel this is from Lowell? Yeah. Well, that's where Kent's getting Joel and Lowell. Sorry for knocking you so, out, of course. So, uh, Get no, it back. yeah, that's Get cool. It back. <laughs> so, anyways, so, uh, Joel Lowell, Joel Lowell is cooking up dope in the kitchen. Mm. Whip it at work. And Trap house. <laughs> 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 Looking at flicking the wrist. So, Joel's, Joel's, Joel's trapping. <laughs> He's trapping in the kitchen. Well, she, he's got some lye out on a pot. And she's like, let me the fuck out of here. And so she fucking throws the lye on his face. Well, he it's burning. You know, lye is, like, is a product to cook meth. And, and it burns him. But he's so he's such an OG veteran of it. He goes and gets the milk, pours it right on him. That was, it cools, G, it that cool, was a G move. It cools man. the burn on him. He's laid back and chill. Yeah. She still can't trust him. Well, then she fucking... Because it was so much activity and she's freaking out and she's weak from losing the blood, she passes out again. Then she wakes up. He's like, "Look," she, she's like, "Why am I not in a fucking hospital, bro? Why didn't you take me to?" The... And he's like, "I don't have a car." He, he just cooks dope in the hey, trailer all day. Car, he didn't have he, a TV. He didn't hey, have. He shit. was really into that meth, man. He did not play. He it was, was about his. It was about his money, man. 
cooking all day. He, he, so he was like, look. Well, then all of a sudden, Buck and Hollister pull up. Yeah. They're his cousin. Because it's in Kentucky and everyone's cousin. And everybody's cousins. Are they so they pull up. He's like, go. shut the fuck up in here. They were like, why didn't you come? You know, they're trying to investigate. Yeah. Why didn't you offer us for a beer? You're acting weird, man. La, yeah, la, la. you never come outside type deal. So anyways, oh, she, he hides her, you know. Um, then then the, the the sheriff's department has been found wind of a, a Cherokee that's been abandoned. What's going on? Well... Come to find out the damn sheriff's department, the head sheriff is crooked. So he's in on it with them cooking, you know, dope. Mm -hmm. So it's a cover-up scene, blah, blah, blah. And it's basically her survival story throughout all this shit. Um, and and it was dope. It was, a, it, was a, it kept, you know, the, the, it was a slow burn thriller. And it kept, you know. Uh, the build-up was beautiful. The build-up was, was nice. Man. And then, like, you know, it's her... Should I say the ending of it or what? Nah, we should let them. Yeah, I guess. I mean, we've ruined every movie since, but fuck it. Yeah, let let's let the should All we right. should we let you got to find out for yourself. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna keep. Yeah, only reason why we keeping this quiet from you motherfuckers is Stu. Them were great guys, man. Yeah, and Harris, I fuck and, with and, Harris. Harris, yeah, I fuck with you. Harris bro. is under the radar on all social media, so don't go looking for that goon, man. Yeah, I fuck with you, bro. Yeah, St Stu Potter was the shit, man. Yeah, but it it it, it the movie like what, what ATX was saying, man. Cause like we we big on this, man. We said it before. If it doesn't get our attention, it doesn't matter. First three to five minutes. Yeah. If we if we once I will look at each other. I look over there. He on his phone. Look, he look over. I'm on my phone. It's kind of like, oh shit, one of us not enjoying it. And then sometimes we both on our phone. That's bad. I don't know if it's from like... <laughs> Sending text to each other. <laughs> I don't know, I don't know if it's because we started drinking monsters when we started. Ooh, the or the, ambition, the anticipation of the... Monsters. The slow offline. burn of the movie. But my stomach is still all clenched up and shit. I got it. I got it. This movie gave me a little, no, a little like that feeling. I like, know what it, what it was. Ah, what what's it gonna was, happen? What it was, like Kent was saying, like low key as me was saying. I mean, it's so relatable, man. It's not like this shit. I'm like, I've never seen this happen before. What are they doing yeah, in there? Are they, are they, are they, are they, are they cooking? What, what are they cooking? Like as soon as that dope dropped and hit the table. We were like, oh, it's a meth lab. Yeah, we that's saw why he back. didn't go to the cops. That's why he didn't go to the cops. We were like, man, why he not? We were like, oh, shit, he in there cooking dope. Like, it didn't take long to figure that out. And then when his cousins came, it's like, oh, shit, that is true. Like, why are you not letting us in the house? Normally, you'll come outside, greet us with a beer, and take us in, and all this and that. You start getting real kind of, like, secretive. But it was kind of cool how they played it off. <laughs> how they played it off to where it was like, when he found out about her, about Sawyer, it was kind of like, oh, he tried, he played off so smooth, like he was keeping her hostage, man. That was kind of, it was pretty, that was pretty funny, because he was like, hey, go, go cook, go make me some coffee and shit, like he was the boss and shit. But it, it was, it was a dope movie, man, and it, it keeps your attention all the way through. So I really, I really big up to them guys, and and how they presented it and everything was just amazing, man. I'm, it's a dope movie. So if you get a chance, they say you can go on. Well, they on uh, YouTube, not YouTube, um, at RustCreek.com, man, yeah, to check out how to view on, it. Um, they got an Instagram page, too. Instagram page. It's, it's yeah, other. there's a link on their IG page. Um, I'm and you can go watch right it. Now. But yeah, if yeah, your snaps that you were snapping while we were doing that, <laughs> that boy snappy stay focused. Yeah. The camera on my nostril. And it's on On Demand, too. It was like seven, about eight yeah. bucks on On Demand, yeah, so you know it, what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, we found it on demand from uh, Xfinity on Demand. Xfinity on Demand. It was worth it. So what's that, like four Tuesday two-piece specials from Popeyes? Get your ass off the couch and go get the get movie. Get your man. ass. Come on, man. Yeah, at uh, Russ Creek, Russ Creek Movie on Instagram. Um, it, uh, and they're, yeah, they're at Lunacy Pods. Uh, we follow them on Instagram. That's their... Their television studio, Lunacy Productions. Their production company. Yeah, uh, Lunacy, Lunacy Prods, not Pods. And uh, they're RustCreekTheFilm.com. So can, I'm excited to see what what next come what's next to come out of Lunacy Pods because if this is any indication of where they're going and the type of work they do, man, super good shit, super good shit. And it, I mean, it hit home for me because, I mean, like I said in the in the interview. This shit happens in all kind of small towns around America all the time. My mom's 
where my mom lives. And shout out to him in Louisiana, the most crooked police force on the planet. They, I mean, they, the whole fucking police force got laid off because of Chad Scott. The motherfuckers were moving dope through the city. You know what I'm saying? And th- this shit happens all the time, and you'll never hear about it because it looks bad for the town. You know what I'm saying? Nobody wants their newspaper saying, hey, guess what happened in this week in news? Well, the guy that's supposed to be protecting you has been selling dope to your children. Hey. Well, it, but it's, ex- it's especially believable because, A, it happens, but it's like in Kentucky, you know, like th- how many resources are available to everybody? Yeah. You want to make some extra cash. There's whiskey and horses. There's all yeah. If whiskey you don't have horses. whiskey, or you don't, if you can't brew whiskey, yeah. and if you can't ride a horse, ride you a gotta horse. cook some fucking meth. Horses live or, or if you're a sheriff, shit. And you, he, he, that's what he said. He was trying to. The head sheriff was trying to get money for his retirement. Yeah, and he was like really like damn. They let you know he was really into that shit. Too. I loved that line. Yeah, that, the rattlesnake. Yeah, line. He, I, I, he's like he's one of the worst kind of snakes there is. And she goes, why? He goes. He don't ride them for it, bite you. Oh, that's some. That was, that was the. You know, we was like, oh, we in here like it. We we on the scene with him and shit, <laughs> commentating. Are we going into the right now? Or? Uh, let's. Uh, did Did y'all see anything else good this week? Oh, uh, we saw this. Hell yeah. Hell yeah. yeah. But, um, so we saw. You know me, man. I'll be watching we, the we movies. We saw a bunch of shit, man. So we saw. Uh, Satan Slaves on uh, Shudder. A couple movies we watched on Shudder. I love Shudder, man. Shout out to Shudder. I know y'all don't even follow us back, but one day you will. I'm doing it right, Shudder. Uh, they terrified. Yeah, man. yeah we it saw was... Terrified. We saw Satan Slaves. We went to the opening weekend of The Escape Room. Fire. Which yeah. was fire. Yeah, it was uh, nice. And we saw, uh, last night we watched Hatchet 2. Yeah. <laughs> Hatchet 2 Hatchet was, was always Hatchet a good time. A... Hey, but let's... Hey, uh... Oh, and I watched Hold the Dark. Which was that fire movie that you turned us on to yeah. that you spoke of last episode? But the terrified um, one is like really, yeah, terrified. Gotta, it's subtitles, but it's like I'm I wasn't even reading the subtitles after See, a while. I which y'all don't talking understand. In my own language. Now I have to the the next part of this conversation. I have to uh, put a little announcement in there to anything that could get these two motherfuckers to read. <laughs> for over four minutes has to be fantastic. Successful. I fucking hate to read, man. I just We knew you did we know you do big fella. We know you You do. know what I'm saying? It's like you get you open up something, it's like, oh I'm gonna read and it's just words. <laughs> it's just fucking words there, man. Like and I have to read them like twenty times for the me to book, remember nothing. The book was never better. Anybody to you that says the words the book was better Get that person out of your life as fast as possible because yeah. they're a serial killer. Yeah, the fucking movies are better. Um, well, they're moving people. Yeah. With, with, I mean, I had never seen a nipple in a, pa- in a piece, <laughs> piece of paper. Well, you see what I'm saying? now you're talking my language. <laughs> um, so should we talk about one of those movies? Yeah, or um, or we're going to um, edit this part out and talk about because we have the Jeff Shelley interview thing. Is that going on here? I don't no. know. Are we, is that two different episodes? That's two different episodes. Yeah, so should we just talk, split the movies in half and talk about half of them then and half of them now? Let's just do, uh, what, what, what number is that? Let's do the escape room. Okay. Escape room was going with Jeff Shelley. Okay, yeah. So let's do Terrified or... Uh, terrified. Terrified or Satan Slaves or Hatchet 2. <laughs> do both. Do Hatchin 2 and Satan Slaves. Perfect. So, Satan Slaves was fucking lit, man. Yeah, like you said, anything that can get me to read on a fucking, uh, any level is the shit. And I didn't even notice, I didn't even notice the, um, the subtitles after a while. It was so creepy. So, Satan Slaves was... So there's, it's a family and it's, I don't know what kind of, what part of Asia it's in. I don't know what language they were speaking. Ha, didn't go to school. Chinese. So just go with Chinese. Sure. Yeah. It was something East and, and, uh, <laughs> and you know, they, uh, I don't know, what the, but anyways, it got me to read English and that's good. They were smaller people than us. Yeah. So and they, they eat noodles. the story is 
So it, you, it's the scene shot. It's a family, right? An Asian family. And mom is sick. Mom rings the bell. Yeah, that shit you know, when crazy. she wants something like help. The, the little she, kids are now scared to go visit her because move. shit is creepy in the house. Mm -hmm. But the family's struggling. It's a big ass family that lives in one house with grandma, everybody. Dad. The pit bull in the back, she pregnant. The, 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 <laughs> the, uh, the rice chicken in the back, she yeah, pregnant. The, the parakeet in the corner, she <laughs> pregnant. So, but, so mom is a pop star. Yeah, mom and, and, and I yeah, thought you would think this is crazy. Little no, yeah, yeah I, this is when I was watching. Person. I thought, oh, Kent would like this because yeah. it has the music part. Uh, so mom is on the radio as a famous H singer. You know, sings like oh, like you yeah. know, mom's on the radio. She has records. Well, the well, the the daughter is like, hey, look. So she's speaking to the record company. Hey, man, our mom is still playing on the radio. We need money. She's sick, and she, he goes. Your mom hasn't sung a new record in three years. We don't have any money for y'all. So, the um, y'all keep fucking distracting me. I'm trying to fucking talk. It, you know what? Some shit happened, okay? And the movie was good. And so, then, so, the, the, uh, the uh, no, it's okay. You can do it. They were like, Mama gotta, Mama gotta produce some shit. Well, yeah. but she's sick. She's, she's sick, dying. so her vocals, her vocals are not as strong. Yeah. Man. And and all she could really do, like he was saying, A Tech was saying, all she could really do is lay in the bed and just she was motionless, lay in the bed, ring a bell for service. The oldest son would go in there and brush her hair every night. The daughter go in there and give her a bath. But it was creepy because they had a uh, the youngest son was um, the youngest son was deaf. He couldn't talk. Yeah. But he was he was a thriller character. He 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 was hilarious. That was our guy, man. Yeah. The, the, and, and the, the middle and the, and the other middle son, the son after him, he was kind of like you know average of kid, kind of like mischief, getting into kind of all kind of stuff. But it was creepy setup because if you look outside the kid's window, it was a graveyard. And I thought about drawing oh, that shit. So I like shit like a street graveyard where they bury everybody in the town. And the dad for some reason mm. used to always like. Leave for work. Like well, was, he, the dad was trying to support yeah, trying the to family because the mom is sick. Because they've always, you know, you kind of got the imp the implication they always survived off mom's check. Yeah, yeah. And I think the money was probably getting low, so the dad finally was like, "Oh shit, we I gotta, gotta make some gotta, moves. I gotta try to sell this house." You know, we, we're yeah. trying to make some moves. So, anyways, that's the scene set up. Well, the mom dies. Yeah. Okay. Dies of a possession. That was weird. First night, it's very sad. All that you know, but they bury the bell starts ringing again. Yeah, like off the rip. They didn't. Ooh, yeah, yeah. yeah they dude. didn't waste no so time with that bell ringing. It was well, like shit. Then that you come to the story kind of develops, and basically, long story short, what you find out is that mom, you know, was a famous pop star, famous pop singer, but couldn't have kids. Wanted kids so bad, so she made a deal with the devil. To have kids, but that deal was to some like devil satanic cult. But the deal was, if you have a kid by the age of seven, if you don't have another kid, then you have to give that kid up. So wait, if you have a kid, right? She has a kid, and if you have a, you gotta have a, you have seven years to have a, have another kid. Yeah, so she has a kid, and by the time that first kid is seven, that when when on that kid's seventh, so it's your youngest kid. By the time your youngest kid is seven, he goes to be sacrificed. So she had what she kept doing is having kids to dodge the devil, sacrifice of the kids. Oh no shit! Yeah. yeah. So no, dude, it's wild. fucking live. So she keeps having kids. Well, it's it's a very poor community. There's an old school well that's in like their house that they have to draw a picture from the well, yeah. and yeah, was, all kind of fucked up shit starts happening. They keep seeing the mom, and really she's yeah, like, they're, the mom's records come on all the time God and damn. play. They're 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 driving in the car. The mom's song comes on the radio. Crazy shit starts to happen. Yeah, it was weird. And they have to they have to survive. So that's the setup. It was fucking lit. Yeah, it was amazing, Good dude. Shit. The jumps it had everything. The creepy yeah. vibe, the, jump scares, yeah. fucking like. 
old weird la- old people are scary in yeah. general. Yeah. <laughs> fucking the you wheel- know? wheelchairs move. It had so much oh, yeah. shit going on. And, in that oh, movie. so then the fucking something happens and grandma gets murked. Yeah. So then grandma starts to pop up and then it, they think yeah, grandma's they, yeah. will, they think grandma's haunting them. But so, the grandma is trying to help them. Yeah, trying to help they don't know. Yeah, they like, oh shit. And it, it starts it, it just it's just like Bah, 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 like yeah. right up, you're like, ah. yeah. And then, so yeah, that's when they find out all the information from one of Grandma's old old homies. He was like, she never liked, she never wanted your mom, or she yeah. never wanted your father. The grandma was the dad's mom. She never wanted your dad to marry her because she couldn't have kids, and she was a famous pop star. She he, she didn't want that life for him. Just whatever. be some shit. Just yeah. too much shit. Well, too mom, much shit. so mom has so much pressure to have kids that she made the deal with the devil. And so he comes to find out, yeah, and then so, well, you know, like one, one like, so the middle kid, the middle son, well, all of a sudden he starts like acting weird in a trance all the time and he's looking, he, he'll like look at the small, the little, the little, the little kid's about to turn seven, of course, mm-hmm. he's deaf. Oh, shit. And the, 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 the older kid will look at him all of a sudden. I'm gonna kill you. Oh you, no, dude, it was live. He's got but a sleep he, next to him. No, he did it in sign language because the little dude was yeah. deaf. He did it in sign language, yeah. like I'm gonna yeah, kill you. I'm gonna kill and that boy kind of looked like, but it was funny because the little the little deaf kid was like hilarious. He'd be telling like the little brothers acting like scared. He'd wake up the little brother. He'd look up. He like no. He'd tell him to sign language. Like no, you you scared. So he just went back down, and the possession got into the the son first. Yeah, and then it was like. When he started doing, he did that sign language. That was like that was some creepy ass shit, man. Yeah, dude. And uh, so, yeah, we're, I, th- I think it's a good idea to stop giving away the endings, yeah, so our yeah. listeners don't get fucking. So you guys, them. check that one out. I'm check about out. to check it out as soon as this podcast go out. I'm gonna make these yeah. motherfuckers on, watch it with me again. On the guts rating system, I, I give it, it an A, man. Yeah, I give, I give it, it a. a full decapitation. Yeah, no man. shit. Yeah, with man. subtitles. With yeah. subtitles. Yeah. subtitles. Full decapitation. Holy shit. It's a rad horror movie. It puts you if, you, like I said, if I don't even think about having to read. Yeah, because what's crazy, yeah. man? You you looking at it so much, I think you start speaking a language. It's like you kind of <laughs> like understanding what they're yeah. saying. You're like Zagazimas. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, it's 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 pretty dope, man. But go check it out, man. You need one fresh nudable. And this is uh, who want to sing the out of tune? Which one of y'all got the the pipes today to sing the nice? But up, but up, but up, nice kicks of the week. Of the ah. week. Nice on your feet, ah, feel sweet. Nice kicks of the week. Hey, ah, nice kicks of the week. Ah, Take it away, hey. Zeno. This is nice kicks of the week, brought to you by Guts Podcast and and Active Athlete. Hey, Active Athlete, we know you're on Cullen, and we know you hear this. Size fourteen player, and size twelve, and size ten. Ten. So that's what's up. But this uh this nice kick of the week by Guts Podcast is our favorites. I think Austin was rocking some the other day. Some crazy ass candy purple patent leather. And oh. I got some crazy ass candy red. But this is the Nike fucking Nike Cortez, man. Gangster Nikes. Gangster G-Nikes, Nikes right? and the G Nikes in the streets, man. Depending on what what area you in, east and west and but you know how it is. See, it was crazy when I was young, we didn't even fuck with G Nikes. No, see, y'all was soldier Reeboks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Y'all, that's that New Orleans. Oh, that's New Orleans. Yeah, yeah. 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 But we rocked the soldier Reeboks out here too. I got but both. But the, the gangster Nikes was yeah, the gangster Nikes was classic because it, it, the ridges on there. When it was what's cool about that shoe, the ridges wet down. It's time to get you another pair yeah. of gangster Nikes. <laughs> yeah, because you start sliding, but. It, it was originally originally released in 1972. Oh, God shit. damn. It was the first modern running shoe designed by Olympic track coach Bill Bowerman. Man, shout out to Bowerman, man. It was created to be a comfortable running shoe that helped long... Oh, ain't this crazy? A comfortable running shoe that helped long distance and rough terrain and was first launched on the 1972 Olympics. That explains why a lot of gangsters got away from people. Yeah. Running, <laughs> running in these damn shoes, man, and hopping over gates. We was fucking Olympians, go, man. Go, 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 go. <laughs> over the years, the Cortez has undergone many designs, changes, and has been released in a number of materials such as leather and suede, as well as original nylon. The key to the comfort of this shoe lies in the sole. The thicker rubber sole was made for durability and was raised heel, helped reduce injuries such as Achilles, Tendon and strains. That's that's amazing that we, you never really think a shoe would be doing that type of stuff, but I guess so. You know, since the conception, the Cortez has remained the icon most recognizably in the Academy Award-winning film 
Drum roll, please. <laughs> Forrest <laughs> Goddamn Gump. Hey. <laughs> Hello, Jenny. <laughs> Forrest Gump. Oh, yeah, he was rocking the Cortezes. Rocking yeah. the Cortezes, baby. The big, old, car- <laughs> big old fat ring. <laughs> Jenny. All kind of shrimp. Jenny <laughs> was sick. But the I char- think it was a grandma's dog. It Jenny said the character receives his classic trainers as a gift and then goes on a run across the length of the breadth of America. It says we do not recommend that shit. Do not run across America in no goddamn Cortezes. But we are pretty sure it's helped the Cortez fly off the shelves. I don't know if that movie helped Cortez fly off the shelves. Because I was rocking Cortezes way before Forrest Gump put his dust ass feet in him. Talking about shrimp and shit. But anyway, I think, I think it was a grandma though. I know, right? Jenna. But anyway, man, if you don't, Jenna, and I'm pretty sure you probably do, man, get a pair of these. And it says, since the release, the Night Cortez has transitioned from running to training to a more casual shoe. This year has been a bit of a, a revival and has seen the streets been sporting the next generation of fashion followers. It's, it's a comfortable shoe, man. I could pretty much say that it's. It's original. It's up there with the Adidas original. You know, Jordan. Yeah, it's super classic. Super classic. We'll call those shoes, those type of shoes, the, you know what I'm saying, the Air Force One, yeah. the G-Nikes. The G-Nikes, the, uh, the Soldier the, Reeboks. Yeah, those are, we call them super classic. Man, is it, and, and then what's crazy about Chuck it. Chuck Taylors. And Chuck Taylors. Like that, and what's yeah. crazy about the Cortez is under 100 bucks, always. Oh, yeah, always. It might be at 100 on some that's come different designs, but it's always under 100 bucks. Okay, so it's like, like $65. It's like 75, 75 bucks, man. 95. You get your, you get your, pay, and you fresh. You fresh to death, man. Yeah. You can't go wrong. But um, that's the Gus podcast. I have nice the, uh, kick of the week, man. I have the, the Nike OG Cortez. black and white ones. Yeah, and I got some candy man, patent candy leather red. purple ones. That I wore to Hey, shout out, shout out to uh, Boston, Massachusetts. We was at the Nike store, man. And we yeah. got those, man. No, that was, we were at. Uh, was it Premium Goods? No, it was a Nike store in Boston. That's where we got those. Yeah. It wasn't the, that little. Nah, it was the, it was when we went to Boston. The yeah, so ones. shout out to Nike in Boston. Nike store in Boston, man. Who would have thought? I got candy purple Cortezes and in Boston, red. Massachusetts. And what's crazy when we bought them, the guy was like, "Man, y'all must not be from here, cause we y'all excited about candy." We're like, "Man, now nah, we're from Houston." He say, "Yeah, I figured that y'all down south somewhere lacking some candy painted shoes." What is that supposed they, to be? I know, man. Go grill mouth. <laughs> I you come know, from the south. You know how it is, man. But we, we love it. That's the nice kicks of the yeah. week. <laughs> nice kicks of the week. Shoes of the week. Shoes of the week. Well, I shit so much you can't see my feet. <laughs> Shoes of the week. How you feel about this episode? You happy? Are you glad we did it? Yeah. It's Are you fun. fulfilled by this? I feel so. How you feel? I, uh, the, the, the personal conversation between us guys. How you feeling about the podcast all together? Um, it's dope, man. Yeah, it's fun. I like, I like, I like the, I like the phone interviews, but man, dope was was the the per, in person interviews, man. Yeah, yeah in person. I love, interviews. I love to like, cause that I look at like when people see like, oh, you do podcasts, but it's like, damn, I never see y'all doing a podcast. Mm-hmm. Like when do y'all do it? But when they get to see a visual or the mic set up, we mobile. We can come to you. You can come to us, man. We'll we'll do this shit like Austin said. We'll do this shit in our cars, man. We don't give a damn. Yeah, I'm uh, the ice cream of, shop. What's your flavored the, ice cream? All shit, the future we'll stuff. Yeah, uh, well, all the big stuff we got planned. Yeah, it's coming up, man. We uh, the homie Dead End Red said he's gonna get giving yeah, interview with us. Yeah, we're gonna be hollering at all them boys. Oh, man. Uh, shout out to my boy Alex Hernandez from the gym in H Town. He wants us to. He loves it, and yeah. he wants us to give our take on Evil Dead. We're going to do that for you, man. We're going to get there. We're yeah. going to do that for you. Definitely. So, yeah, Alex. we got a bunch of cool interviews lined up. Oh, we have um, a movie premiere of the, the guy who did uh, Final Destination um, yeah. did a movie called The Final Wish, and we're going to go to the premiere to that. That's coming up, huh? That's coming up January 24th. Cool. Yeah. Right around the corner. Right around the corner. So, man. a lot of big things coming, man. And, um, and and we getting we getting set up for the for the the horror horror just, Texas horror man yeah, yeah Texas just, frightmare Texas frightmare we pumping ourselves up for it that's gonna be live in May I'm glad to see you guys like keeping the energy and that you're still excited about yeah, it every dope, week, man because that's what usually happens is somebody starts a project and you know the the, the reality sets in of what the project really is you know what I'm saying mm-hmm. is because everybody when they start something all they see is the finished result. Yeah. All they see is the thing that's happening next week. You know what I'm saying? They don't they don't understand the work and dedication and how you got to keep that yeah. fire alive. It doesn't happen overnight. Like this. Yeah. 
And I'm just really happy to see you motherfuckers really keeping Man, what are you, you fucking quitting? <laughs> so, you quitting us already, you motherfucker? Know, you know what that the... being said, <laughs> I ate too many ribs. He said, <laughs> that being hey, said, I this, love this, this shit. This is my last day as a heartbeat. <laughs> hey, I love this shit. I love <laughs> doing this with y'all. Shit. My favorite parts of doing this is when we're just sitting around talking and I forget yeah. we're actually talking to this hey, but mic. Because what? Because we said that once you start doing it so much, this all this shit is going to disappear. Yeah, that's the best part. That, this shit will disappear to where it's not. You know, the first episode going to feel like that. We like Bullshit oh, shit. with my brothers. But it's like Talking it horror movies. Fucking hoes and getting money. Hey, Fuck bitches, get money. Your baby mama's in my DM. Hey, hey, your baby mama's in my DM. Skibby hey, hey. Well... <laughs> With that being said, <laughs> I appreciate you guys listening. As is always, uh, hit up the Instagram, hit up the SoundCloud, hit up the iTunes, hit up the Spotify. We're on Spotify now. We're hey, to be on all the streaming uh, Broke Spread rich. the word. <laughs> tell your friends. Tell your peoples. Uh, keep listening. We're going to keep working hard for you, man. I appreciate y'all listeners so much. I appreciate Harris and... Stu Pollard, Stu Pollard for uh, coming on and giving a dope interview and really uh, not being fucking lames and really putting some effort into it, man. I really like when people come on the podcast and, and give dope. a shit about what they're saying and give a you know give their full attention and it's not you know it's really dope, man. They they put, took a, took time aside to you know set aside some quiet time and really put. I the can't energy believe into we it. fucked up the Central Time thing again. Yeah, yeah. But we. I told you we're gonna get a time map. We're gonna we just, gotta do we're that. Kill it like that. If yeah. So anyways, if y'all um want to hear our fucking crazy outtakes on any horror movies that you like, man, we love watching them. So just yeah, hit, hit us, us up, up man. Or hit you can see us in them streets. And then if you see uh another thing, if you see anything of us wearing any guts podcast gear that we're wearing, any uh, hats, shirts, hoodies, anything like that, hit us up. Uh, we'll get it to you. You know, we have merch for sale, but we don't model the merch on the Instagram pages. We model the merch on ourselves. So just look through the videos, look through the fucking the uh, pictures on the Instagrams or the snaps and shit like that. You'll if you see want the any sauce. Of that shit, if you want some of the sauce, you want us to break we you dripping. off that shit. Uh, we we'll drip that shit right into your mailbox if you drip that shit straight like into my motherfucking vent. Aliens and hey. shit. We like like dripping candy paint. So, off an of alien sack. Uh, yeah, and they're made to order. All you got to do is drip into the Venmo or Cash App, and we got you, baby. So, uh, like I said, I appreciate you guys listening, and I am Low Key As Me for Guts Podcast. Zaino the Vision. It's your boy Space Viking. We see y'all next week. Woo! I'm going to miss y'all.